So I'm uh, Patrick Milton. I'm a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the Freie Universität Berlin and a research affiliate at the Forum on Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. And it's in that latter capacity that, I'm, that I was speaking here today to talk about a project that I'm involved in called A Westphalia for the Middle East. Westphalia was a peace treaty which was signed on the 24th of October 1648 which ended the Thirty Years' War in Central Europe which was one of the most uh, destructive and costly wars in European history. Um, it involved many of the major powers. It started as a, as a civil war within the Holy Roman Empire which is the first German Empire and it then spread to involve outside powers, uh, primarily Spain, Netherlands, Sweden, and France. And so the, the peace treaties were signed uh, after about five years of continuous negotiations, during which time the fighting continued in parallel to the negotiations. But after five years, they finally managed to, to settle almost all of their differences and to set up a stable peace order for Central Europe, which lasted for about 150 years, and from that time onwards, there was no, there was no longer a, any religious war in Central Europe. So it was very successful in that sense of banishing religious war from Central Europe. Um, well, the, the the war itself is on a on a on a basic level to some extent analogous with what is happening in the Middle East. On you could argue it's it's a superficial level, but in many ways I think it's 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 quite remarkably similar in the sense that you, in both cases, it was a multipolar environment. There were asymmetrical power conflicts. Um, in the nineteenth century, the the types of war we had. Um, involved large states pretty much evenly matched fighting conventional wars, which is not the case now, obviously, uh, in the Middle East, and also was not the case at that earlier period in European history in the early, 60, in the early uh, 17th century, where you had um, sub-state actors, also to some extent non-state actors, fighting asymmetrical conflicts. Um, that's one of the main similarities. The second similarity is that um, in both cases, so in Europe then and in the Middle East now, conflict would often spread and become more um, general to the region through civil wars attracting outside interference and outside intervention. That's what's been happening in Syria and in Yemen and that's exactly what happened in Germany where the war started as an internal rebellion in Bohemia against the Austrian um, emperor by his subjects and then by his um, uh, the princes that were also subject to him. So this civil war then attracted outside involvement um, with unexpected interventions, primarily Sweden and France. Uh, and I think the third similarity is the fact that in both scenarios, religion plays an important part. That sectarian tensions tend to merge with and exacerbate political conflicts and constitutional conflicts, but also take on a destructive dynamic of, of their own. I wouldn't say they are primarily religious wars. I think it's several factors, but it, it, it is often hard, I think, to, to separate the two. But I, but Religion is, is certainly an element, and it is certainly something that makes um, a general settlement harder than just dealing with, you know, pure interest. Um, and I think it was, and what we can, what we can learn from, from the early modern example is that the best way probably to deal with religion is to, is to accept that there are going to be religious differences, to accept this this diversity and to try and disregard theological elements and to try and manage coexistence through clearly 
set uh, legal and political parameters while taking out issues that no one could really agree on, issues of, of truth and, and theology. Well, I think the, the main source of inspiration and encouragement comes from the fact that the, the problems that Europeans were facing during the Thirty Years' War, the, the conflicts that were being fought, the, the, the points at, at, of dispute were to some extent more, or seemed at least to be more daunting and more intractable even though, than what is going on now. Um, and the inspiration is that after five years of diplomacy, after five years of, of negotiation from about 1643 to, to 48, they did manage to succeed. And the reason they did is because they, after trial and error during the preceding war, during which there had always been negotiation and attempts, there was never actually a total war in the sense of the second, in the, in the in the mold of the Second World War in which there was an attempt to completely annihilate your enemy and destroy your enemy. This was not, the Thirty Years' War was not about total destruction, it was about um, the parties trying to impose their vision of peace against their enemies by using force. And I think the, the, what they realised towards the end of the conflict was that any attempt to deal, to create a peace settlement which does not include all parties to conflict but which excludes some was going to fail. So earlier on in the, in the war there was an attempt uh, mediated by the Pope to, to, to reach a settlement between the Catholic powers only, so between Spain fighting against France, Spain in alliance with Austria. This didn't really work out because it, just, because it left the Protestants out. And another example was the, the attempt by the Emperor to create a peace within Germany, within the Holy Roman Empire, uh, with, with the exclusion of the outside powers and then deal with the outside powers. This didn't work out. So they realised that to, to, to successfully overcome this crisis, they needed an all-inclusive peace congress, which was referred to at the time as a universal peace congress involved all parties to conflict. And I think that is a lesson that can be drawn, is that if, for example, um, Turkey and Iran and Russia reached some sort of agreement, that would not mean that the, the fighting would stop in, in, in the particular region. There's always going to be other groups that, are, that feel bypassed or that feel neglected. And so what needs to be done is to include everyone into an all-inclusive conference, and that can take years. But what they did was they, they came together in two neighbouring cities and just negotiated for years until they found a settlement. I think that's, the, that's a major source of, of inspiration. And another factor is the, the, um, just the, some of the general sort of techniques that were, that were used to, to, to try and achieve the peace. The, I mentioned earlier the, the disregarding of theological factors and also the system of guarantee. There was, there was not much trust at the outset of the negotiations that one, the opposing sides didn't trust each other, but they still were willing to negotiate because one reason was that they, that they agreed to, to mutually guarantee everything. So if one side um, felt uh, violated in, in one particular area, they could, they could rely on the fact that the others would, would step in and enforce the entire settlement. I think this is a, a very important lesson, is, is the mutual guarantee, that it needs to be mutually guaranteed, because this can set up, if, if done correctly, a system of collective security. The Thirty Years' War is not really, was not really a religious war primarily either. I think the, 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 the similarity lies in the fact that it, was, that it was one factor of many and that it merged with factors of self-interest, realpolitik, and that this could make um, existing conflict dynamics all the more destructive and all the more toxic. And, and it was this element that was, that was to some extent, that was to, removed not as a source of conflict, but as a source of, of war. The religious confessional strife continued in Central Europe, but because it was managed in a, such a detailed way,
legally, politically, it resulted in, in what historians have referred to as the juridification of sectarian conflict or the juridification of, of social conflict in general. Um, they basically decided to reach arrangements that were so um, minute in their detail. So for example, in, in mixed confessional cities, they would agree that um, there would be one ruler who was Protestant followed by one ruler who was Catholic and they would sort of alternate. And that was not a perfect solution. It was not indicative of any sort of modern philosophy of toleration. It was just a, an expedient solution to try and give a minimum level of, of satisfaction to both sides and prevent them fighting over it. If, it, if it's clearly set in stone what the mechanisms of coexistence are, and if it's accepted by all as, as, a, as a valid treaty and constitutional law, because it was not just a, a peace treaty between warring states, it was at the same time a fundamental constitutional law for the Holy Roman Empire. And if, if people agreed that that was the, the, the guiding principle, they'd be more willing to go to court and sue their opponents because this legal channel of appeal existed and was strengthened by Westphalia, rather than uh, take to the battlefield. Okay. I think an important um, factor is that wars sometimes occur through misunderstandings or through fears of the suspected plans of the opponent without knowing exactly what it is that the opponent really wants to do and there's and this can become more or less paranoid and I think to, to, to remove these these misunderstandings and to avoid sleepwalking into war it's very important that each side and each power sets out very clearly and honestly and transparent, transparently what their core security interests are as well as w what they imagine to be their own legitimate sphere of, of influence that they want to maintain and what their red lines are, which, they, which, which for them are, are very crucial. And often, often it is not really known until you negotiate what these core interests are for which that they would be willing to fight. And if, and if that is set out very clearly in a, in a sense of mutuality, then I think everyone has a clearer picture of what is important to the other side and thereby to, to avoid stumbling into conflict inadvertently and sectarian tensions might sort of serve to exacerbate this. So one, one element, another element of, of Westphalia that, that might be useful for the current context is it, it included um, stipulations which outlawed or tried to undercut um, forms of sectarian hate speech which would serve to exacerbate tensions and, and political problems.